So hello everyone and welcome uh, to this finals crash course uh, in dermatology. My name is Dahlia. I'm I'm a respiratory uh, registrar, but uh, I've been asked to deliver this session on dermatology. Next slide. Um, so just as an overview, these are the topics that we'll be covering. As I say, it's a crash course. Um, it's it by no means covering everything, but I thought a good overview and particular um, the important points uh, that you should know for finals. Um, I will focus a bit more on those that tend to come up more in exams. There are quite a few slides and um, we don't need to go through them all but I've included some, especially at the end, because they do come up. Um, I would appreciate some interaction. Obviously, um, it's good uh, Zoom etiquette to be muted when you're not speaking, but please feel free to unmute if you had something to say. I would like some interaction. Um, I've interspersed some questions along the uh, slideshow just to keep it a bit fresh and I would like to hear your voices as well. OK, next slide, please. So just to start off, a very kind of quick. Basic question really in um, in dermatology, can you label the diagram? So does anyone want to shout out what A is? Most superficial skin layer. Epidermis. Brilliant, thank you. Yep, A is epidermis. B. Dermis. Brilliant, yes, B is the dermis. C. Uh, fat. Yep, it's a subcutaneous tissue. And final one, D. Just type it in the chat as well if you want. Anyone for D? I haven't got anything in the chat yet. Fine, next slide. Oh, we got sebaceous gland. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for that. There you go. So well done. Um, next slide. A bit of terminology. Um, so can anyone tell me a ray spot measuring less than five millimeters in diameter? I'll give you some options, macule, pustule, papule. Just give it a bit. Sometimes the chat takes a bit of time to load as well. Oh, got papule. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you for that. What about, sorry, that was less than five millimetres in diameter. I did say more than. What about B, a raised spot measuring more than five millimetres in diameter? Anyone has a guess? We'll come back to it. What about C? A blister less than five millimeters in diameter. Anyone? Still nothing in the chat yet. No, we got um pustule. Close, not quite. Um, we will go over these. Uh, what about a blister measuring more than five millimeters in diameter? Uh, 
the final one. Bullet. Yes, brilliant. Bullet. Thank you for that. Um, next slide, please, Ashvini. So it's a papule that's the raised spot more than, uh, sorry, less than five millimetres in diameter. As long as it's more than five millimetre, it becomes a nodule. Um, this is different to lung nodules, um, but you don't have to worry about that at all. See a vesicle. Um, so they're the small blisters. Um, a pustule is essentially a papule with pus in it, uh, whereas a vesicle is a fluid filled um, lesion. And then bulla is just the only difference is the size of it. OK, and so you've got the different schematics at the bottom there. And you can see in the schematics that vesicles and bullas are basically in the epidermis and nodules are more, well, they, they are still in the epidermis, but they do touch on the dermis. Next slide, please. So this just shows you more of um, these lesions. So papules also kind of indent into the dermis, but they are in the epidermis. Plaques are very superficial. Um, and flat but raised. Um, you can see this gentleman here has macules which are impalpable. Um, they're not raised at all. And at the bottom there you can see the plaque of cutaneous lupus with some overlying scales. Next slide please. Um, this just shows breaks in the skin and the difference so ulcers tend to be quite deep and erosion is a superficial break in the skin and a fissure can be sharp sided. Next slide, please. So name the facial lesion. What does it look like? And you can try and describe it if you want to as well. I got BCC in the chat. Well done. What makes you think it's a BCC? Yes. Well done. Yeah, brilliant. Um, it's it's that shiny pearled edge, uh, and then you can see the central telangiectasia there. Uh, next slide, please. So BCC is the most common form of skin cancer and it arises as DNA damage from exposure to UV radiation and that triggers changes in the basal cells of the epidermis leading to uncontrolled growth. Now they can look pretty different and there are loads of different appearances of basal cell carcinoma which is why it's important to um, excise and um, or, or you know take a biopsy um, just to confirm it histologically because they can be open sores, they could be red patches, pink growth, they could be shiny bumps. Typically they have the rolled edge appearance with a central indentation and the telangiectasia. They rarely metastatize, sorry metastasize, but they can be quite locally invasive so they do need to be taken out. So um, next slide please. Uh, uh, next slide. So treatment, uh, multiple forms of treatment. Um, now, a, a common question in um, in finals uh, can be just uh, which one you'd go for. Um, and normally they wouldn't have all these options for you to choose amongst these. They would have other treatments um, that you wouldn't go for. So um, mainly excision with histological uh, confirmation. Now, Mohs micrographic surgery is when you take serial sections and examine them histologically, and if there are still margins with the the um, abnormal cell, you go back to the patient, take some more out, and have a look at the margins. Go back to the patient until all the margins are clear, and that has high cure rates. Um, some 
in elderly patients, they do radiotherapy where the lesions are extensive and major surgery wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, but we don't tend to do those in the younger, especially if they present earlier. There can be um, photodynamic therapy, um, which is when you have a topical delta aminovaleic acid um, that they add to it, which makes it photosensitive and they expose it to light and it destruct, essentially destructs the lesion and um, the clearance rate under photodynamic therapy is about 85 percent. Um, and but it, it does it has to be a superficial one. So if it's become nodular and gone down further into the dermis, then it's um, not a good option. And then there's topical uh, fluorouracil or imiquimod. Um, imiquimod is the, one of the newer topical immunomodulatory treatments, and it's been shown to have clearance rates between 70% and 100%. So um, it is pretty good and again, better for superficial rather than nodular tumours. OK, next slide, please. Oh, actually, I didn't mention for the BCC ones. Sorry, if you if you just go back. So there's cryotherapy, carotage and cautery. Um, now, Caretage and, and cautery aren't recommended um, if they're recurrent um, and they don't necessarily get rid of everything. Um, so and also you don't have a sample to check histologically. Um, these can be options provided um, in an SBA format. Obviously, if you get those options and there's none of the others, go for them. But if you've got Mohs micrographic surgery uh, and then cryotherapy or caretage, then obviously go for Mohs. Um, caretage is, um, is a, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's essentially got a loop at the end of the instrument and it just, it's designed to just swill it off, but you're essentially digging it out um, and you don't get a, a nice clean sheet to examine histologically. Okay, next slide please, Atvini, thank you. Um, so name the lesion. What does this look like? Just give them a bit of time. Feel free to shout out or put it in the chat. Um, got melanoma? Yes, yes it's a melanoma. Um, what makes you think it's a melanoma? No. It's like asymmetrical, it's got irregular borders, multiple colours, and it looks quite big. Yes. Um, yes, thank you, Joe. So, um, it, it, I mean, the, the obvious thing to look at is you can see melanin, you can see pigmentation, makes it likely to be a melanoma. Um, if you, uh, next slide, please. So, Essentially, melanomas differ from basal cell carcinomas in that they originate from the melanocytes in the basal layer of the epidermis. Um, and that's why you get the changes in colour. Having said that, you can get an amelanocytic melanoma where it's essentially pale. Um, and the, this one's responsible for 1% of deaths from cancer. Next slide, please. Um, and it's the commonest in the over 75s and third commonest in the young. Now, this one does metastasize and it is very important to recognize early. Sorry, that's um, part of the slide is wrong. Uh, I've just noticed actually. Um, it says rare, rarely metastasize. That's wrong. That's for BCC. Ignore that. Sorry for that. Um, and so next slide please so there's a seven point checklist for major and minor features 
that the British Association of Dermatologists or BAD have outlined um, and essentially they've got if they have any of the major signs or three of the minors they are suspicious um, and they're just associated with increased risk of a melanoma so it's important to examine such lesions um, and uh, check for regional lymph nodes and examine the abdomen for an enlarged liver or spleen another indication of malignancy sorry not malignancy metastatic uh, disease next slide please um, as joe has mentioned um, look for a b c d e a very easy way of uh, looking at uh, these lesions so a for asymmetry is it asymmetrical if you put a line in the middle it does it reflect b look at the border typically an, a malignant melanoma has a very irregular border color so there would be color changes so if you have a mole and then there's a freckle in it that would also be suspicious um, and just any changes in color diameter um, or dark or it changes in depth um, so if it's if the lesion is about six millimeters or larger it's increased risk of um, becoming malignant um, and evolving so if there's any change um, or any new symptoms such as bleeding itching crusting uh, that might be a warning sign uh, next slide, please. Now, you don't at all need to know or learn this, but this is essentially the cancer staging system for a cutaneous melanoma. Um, and what you can take from this is for stage 0, 1A and 2A, they don't require further investigation and imaging. Um, but beyond 2B, they'd need a chest X-ray, liver ultrasound, CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, so that would be a staging CT to look for any evidence of metastasis and blood tests include a full blood count, liver function tests, LDH um, and if there's any indication of bone disease, further um, bone scans. Um, anyone at stage 2b or beyond should be managed at an oncology centre um localized metastases can be excised again in the in the same way as bcc um or subjected to radiotherapy if uh, that were more appropriate um there's no benefit from immunotherapy unlike in bcc and it's important obviously to catch these early so self-examination uh, of you know if patients with loads of moles or very fair skin uh, were to present just encouraging self-examination as once they've had one um, malignant melanoma they are likely to have another okay so next slide please survival rates obviously with increasing stage go down uh, so it's best to pick these up early and in terms of prevention obviously better than cure limiting sun exposure and patient education about self-examination all right next slide please name the lesion so that's squamous cell carcinoma yes well done what made you think that it's got like a scaly plaque i think it's a little bit of blood as well yeah and can you think of a differential diagnosis anyone basal cell as well can be can be um it can be difficult until you've excised and actually examined um, checked histologically uh to tell them but any other um that can also develop a scale so keratocanthoma or something? That's it. Yeah, well done. Uh, keratocanthoma. Next slide, please. Uh, so those two. 
And so um, squamous cell is essentially, it's the second most common form of skin cancer after basal cell. And um, as the name suggests, it's DNA damage from exposure to UV that causes changes in the squamous cells in the epidermis, causing an uncontrolled growth. Um, next slide, please. So, um, which of, so I've put some risk factors on this slide. Which of these is not a risk factor of squamous cell? Just have a look through at those. I should have put letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, so we've got age. So two people saying age. Yeah. Yeah, well done. So um, that, yes, that's the one. So it's actually a risk factor with older age. So age above 50 rather than younger than 50. Um, all the others are risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma. Now, when it comes to questions in the exam, um, they do analyze um, and they are very specific in what they're asking you. So um, I popped that in there on purpose uh, because I've written which is not a risk factor. Um, that can be multiple. If I've put which one of these is not a risk factor, obviously pick one. Um, so just make sure when you look at these questions, you look at the wording because it is carefully chosen. Because sometimes it can be, you know, pick three. Um, OK, next slide, please. So treatment of squamous cell. Again, it is very much like uh, BCC, You've got excision cryotherapy, caressage and cautery, which are there if it's very superficial. Um, again, caressage and cautery, not ideal if it's a facial lesion, if it's anywhere else, um, then fair dues, just because of the aesthetic, uh, you know, um, appearance afterwards. Mohs micrographic surgery, again, is gold standard with high cure rates. Um, and you could also use topical fluorouracil for it. Uh, next slide, please. Just a quick slide on keratic anthoma, pre-malignant condition, and it is a consequence of chronic uh, skin exposure. Um, in terms of management, much the same as the others, but here it's prevention of further risk by limiting your sun exposure using sun creams. <coughs> you can give them a two, three week course of the five fluorouracil cream um, and as well as topical diclofenac, which is of moderate efficacy but has fewer side effects. The um, five FU cream can cause the skin to become quite red and inflamed. <coughs> Sorry. So if you were to give five fluorouracil cream, Give a bit of topical hydrocortisone following application just to settle the inflammation. Um, another option, top topical imiquimod, um, again, another immunomodulator. And I mean, this one can have cryotherapy, carotid or cauterization um, if it's uh, superficial. Brilliant. So next slide. <coughs> Sorry. So um, 
going back to the overview, this is what we wanted to cover. Next slide, please. So we've just covered, hopefully, dermatological malignancies, albeit in a very um, brief manner. Next slide, please. OK, give three nail signs seen in psoriasis. Pop them on the group or shout them out, whichever. Not someone saying pitting? Yeah. Onchiasis. Brilliant. Anyone else? Next slide. Anything else? There's nothing in the chat. Fine, no. next slide. No. I mean, there are loads. <laughs> so you're correct. Pitting. Um, you, you could see that on that nail there. Onycholysis is where the nail is essentially coming off. You can get discoloration of the nail. Something called an oil spot sign. Um, uh, salmon patch. Subungual hyperkeratosis is essentially um, increased uh, kind of scale beneath the nail. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Leukonychia, the white lines, Bow's lines, and dystrophy, so crumbling nail. Um, you don't need to know all of those, obviously. Uh, pitting and nicolysis are the most common. Next slide, please. So psoriasis, uh, just very briefly, um, you get nail psoriasis in about 50% of those who suffer from psoriasis. 10% you get psoriatic arthritis. They typically get a joint inflammation. It's usually an oligo arthritis, so it affects one joint like the knee or the hand. Um, and um, it involves a bit of synovitis. There's pustular psoriasis, which I've shown in the picture below. It, this um, affects the palms, plantar region, um, and can involve fissuring, be quite painful. Um, there's flexural, where it's uh, visible in the flexures. These are usually non scaly, unlike the extensor psoriasis. Guttate is almost like being sprayed by paint or raindrop patches, common in children and teenagers, uh, usually after a strep throat or um, after a viral illness. And then there's generalised erythrodermic psoriasis uh, that is essentially a flare after a rapid withdrawal of steroids and this affects most of the body surface and can uh, make a patient systemically unwell um, with dehydration. Next slide, please. So typically, uh, when you're describing these plaques, well demarcated, you can draw a line around them. They're erythematous and they have silvery scales. These scales can be easily scratched off and you get this pinpoint bleeding sign, which is called Auspitz. Typically, you have an extensive distribution. Epidemiology, 2% of the population. It peaks in your 20s and your 50s and is equal between the sexes. There are two pathologies there. Uh, one is too much kerat keratinocyte proliferation. And two is an inflammatory infiltration of the dermis and epidermis by T cells, which triggers a cytokine release, especially TNF alpha and that causes inflammation and proliferation. Next slide. So triggers, it's got multiple triggers, can get worse as stress, skin injury. So if, for example, you've had surgery and you have, or you've had laceration, you can get some psoriatic patches there called Koibner phenomenon. Multiple um, diseases cause Koibner phenomenon. I've not spelt phenomenon right there. <laughs> Phenomenon. <laughs> um, strep infection can make it worse. Another thing, medication. So it can be iatrogenic, such as uh, you know, commencement of beta blockers, lithium, anti-malarials, 
Um, diagnosis is clinical. Don't need to uh, take um, a sample. Um, next slide, please. This is just a quick slide on the management of psoriasis, mainly topical. Um, you, you step up, so from topical to physical to systemic with severity. Um, you, you've got all these preparations, usually emollients and dithranol initially, um, and then step up to vitamin D analogues. Uh, because they essentially regulate cell division um, and hopefully reduce the scaling and you can just step them up to a retinoid corticosteroid um, which are used generally for the flexures in the face. Uh, scalp treatment if you have scalp psoriasis. Now um, if it's if it covers a larger region phototherapy with narrowband UVB um, and I mean, this has side effects, of course, uh, including skin cancer and premature aging. However, if, you know, it's all a, a, a balance of risk and benefit. If you have even worse uh, psoriasis, methotrexate as a, an immunosuppressant um, and cyclosporin, acetretin, another retinoid and biologics, uh, particularly anti-TNF. Um, next slide, please. So that's going back to our overview. Next slide, please. Um, and we've covered psoriasis. Next slide, please. So give two different types of eczema or dermatitis because, you know, there are loads of different types. Pop them in the chat, shout them out. Got atopic ex eczema. Yep. Contact dermatitis. Yep. I mean, technically, that's two, but we can wait for some more if you want. That is two, yes. Um, next slide, please. Well, we've got more than two types. <laughs> So uh, discoid, um, that's the image that's on the slide. You can get varicose eczema, typically on the shins of elder people um, and due to poor venous return, uh, astiototic um, and pomphollix, which is an, again a, an autoimmune reaction, uh, also associated with blistering, contact as you've mentioned, occupational again another version of irritant dermatitis next slide please uh, so dry itchy skin and also characterized by exoriation because it's quite itchy so you get the lines of the itch um, there are acute and chronic changes so acute erythema swelling fissures you get the weeping and crusts Always important with eczema to check for infection. They get, um, they always get um, super added infection just from the breaks in the skin. It is, a, you know, a break in the barrier and can let infection in. Then there are chronic changes. So lichenification is the thickening of the skin because of um, all the scratching. Um, and Eczema is usually on the flexural surfaces, but obviously it can cover everywhere and typically follows a relapsing remitting um, pattern. Now I've popped some uh, complications at the bottom there. Again, in infection, molluscum contagiosum, which is the viral uh, pox, herpes simplex and HPV, all because essentially you've got a breakdown in that uh, barrier. Uh, and then you've got post-inflammatory hyperhypopigmentation um, where the lesions are uh, and also side effects of steroids. Next slide, please. So I've just popped on some epidemiology and um, etiology for you there. 
I mean, that is multifactorial, um, can be a topic, can be genetic, um, and some are have associated food allergies, which can also exacerbate the eczema. Next slide, please. So again, with eczema diagnosis, not just clinical, um, I mean, based on the history, looking at the pattern, uh, but also you can do a RAST to check for allergens and IgE to anything else. And also swabs, very important to check for um, anything they might grow. Uh, if there's any super added infection, they typically do require some courses of antibiotics should they get infected. And management again is uh, topical, systemic, physical. I've also included lifestyle here just because some of it is irritant. Um, and um, with mild eczema, you can get away with emollients and occasional corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation. Sometimes they can do some wet wraps um, to uh, keep the area moist. Um, and use use uh, immunomodulators. Systemic treatments are usually short term uh, for flares and then again phototherapy has been shown to work with eczema as well. Next slide please. And that's eczema done. Next slide. So 45 year old lady who's got this rash, she's got stiff joints, fatigue, We've recently been to Mallorca. Can anyone describe the rash? Nasal sparing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, someone's popped in butterfly rash. Brilliant. And what's the most likely diagnosis alongside the joints and the fatigue? <coughs> Yes, brilliant. Thank you, Miguel. Um, next slide, please. So it is indeed the butterfly or mallow rash, uh, typically of SLE, um, again associated with uh, joint problems, the arthritis, and can get worse with sun exposure, particularly going to a hot country. Um, there are other uh, skin manifestations of SLE. Can anyone think of any? We can always come back to that. That's fine. Next slide, please. This moves us on to cutaneous manifestations of systemic disease. OK, so I've popped on loads of pictures there um, and we can start from the top left. Necrobiosis lipoidica, shiny, painless. You get It can be yellow, red or brown uh, skin, typically over the shin and can be associated with telangiectasia. This is associated with diabetes. And you can also get granuloma annulare. Um, which is an autoimmune reaction. They don't fully understand the mechanism, but again, associated with diabetes. Um, the one next to that, uh, those are rheumatoid nodules. And they typically uh, are over the extensor surface up to the elbow in poorly controlled rheumatoid arthritis. You've got on the right there another example of a butterfly rash of SLE which shows nasal sparing. Underneath that you've got the dermatitis herpetiformis of celiac disease. This is an IgA um, reaction. Um, autoimmune can be very, very itchy, um, treated with Dapsone. Um, and then moving on to erythema nodosum. Um, 
that's an inflammation of the subcutaneous fat. You get tender erythematous nodular lesions, typically over the shins, but can be anywhere. And it usually resolves within six weeks. Um, this doesn't, doesn't just occur as a result of inflammatory bowel disease, but as strep throat, TB, brucellosis, systemic diseases such as sarcoid, um, IBD, obviously Betchett's, can be a result of uh, or associated with malignancy or lymphoma, so does require um, further investigation if there's no other potential cause. And also medication um, such as the oral contraceptive pill, penicillins and sulfonamides. And they can also get it as a result of uh, pregnancy. Um, and then next one is pyoderma gangrenosum. Now this usually starts off as a red papule and then it spreads to form a necrotic ulcer with a violaceous border, they typically call it. And patients can also be systemically unwell, associated with IBD, um, typically Crohn's. And then the one at the bottom left is pretibial myxedema of hypothyroidism. Next slide, please. So you've got some others. So you've got the Crest syndrome. So C stands for calcinosis cutis. Um, you can see that uh, on the superficial skin there of the palm of the hand. The R is the Reynolds phenomenon. You get um, vasoconstriction of the peripheral vessels. O or E, esophageal problems, so typically webbing. Um, S, sclerosis, so they can get furrowing lines around the mouth. T, telangiectasia. There's also an image there of acanthosis nigricans, which can anyone uh, remember which malignancy that's associated with? Is it gastric? Yes, yes, well done. Can also happen as a result of diabetes, but if they don't have diabetes, important to check uh, for malignancy. Um, the other on the right there is uh, evidence of dermatomyositis. Again, that can be um, underlying malignancy either of the lung, breast, um, or um, ovarian um, or GI tract. So in dermatomyositis, you've got that heliotrope rash, which essentially looks like you've been punched in the eyes, really, uh, but tends to be kind of purpley. You've got the Gotrans papules, which are typically over the knuckles, um, and you can also get Paget's disease of the nipple. Um, and what else? The one in the bottom middle there is another example of acanthosis nigricans. I think that's all of those. Next slide, please. So some more pictures, glorious pictures. So you've got the different erythemas. Um, we'll go over that later, but you've got minor and major. Essentially, I think I hope you can appreciate on the minor um, the target uh, appearance of them um, and their distribution on in the middle there of that child it's essentially gone everywhere. Um, typically a drug reaction um, but we will uh, go over that. I've got some some causes there so it can be a result of herpes simplex, mycoplasma, other viruses. Um, and then you've got erythema marginatum which is very rare don't see it nowadays, um, but is it typically associated with rheumatic fever? And if they ever come up in SBAs, rheumatic fever. <laughs> um, and then you've also got the picture of Stephen Johnson syndrome, where the erythema multiforme has worsened because it's part of a um, spectrum. Next slide, please. So some vascular changes. These are just the vasculitides. 
Livido reticularis is lace-like. Um, you've got the splinter hemorrhages of potential endocarditis, Henoch-Schon line purpura, typically vasculitic rash of the lower limbs, usually um, the flexural component. So that's why you can see it's buttocks and back of the knees. And then you can also see it on the dorsum there of the foot. A vasculitic rash typically does not blanch. Next slide, please. Back to our overview, and that's the cutaneous manifestations of systemic disease. Next slide, please. So, which medication is used to treat only severe acne? And B, give two important considerations when prescribing it. Now, it's not a dermatology presentation if you haven't included a bit of acne. So I have to <laughs> include that. Well done. Yeah, isotretinoin. Um, yes, pregnancy. Have to be careful in pregnant. Well, you can't give it in pregnancy. Anything else? It's teratogenic. Yes, someone's put uh, Joe. Thank you. Liver. Yes, you've got to monitor LFTs uh, because it is associated with hepatotoxicity. Next slide, please. So, yeah, it's also associated with depression and suicide. So it's important to check their mood um, and also important to monitor lipids. Next slide, please. What's the name given to this condition? Or what's it associated with, if that's easier? Ah, oh, well done. Acne rosacea, yes. So next slide, please. The actual name is rhinophyma and it is associated with acne rosacea. Next slide, please. So this is essentially an inflammatory facial dermatosis characterised by erythema and pustules. It's unknown as to the cause and affects females and males equally, commonest in middle age, and typically starts with just flushing. Um, it differs from acne vulgaris in that you don't get comedones, although you can get pustules, um, but they're not squeezable spots essentially. Um, and I've just listed a few of the features there of um, acne rosacea. Um, can get lymphedema of the cheeks, nose, forehead and chin. Um, rhinophyma can happen and that's just a hyperplasia of the sebaceous glands in the, um, in the nose and the cartilage. It happens more with men um, and rosacea is exacerbated by sunlight and topical steroids. So it's different from other conditions in that steroids don't treat it. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is the management of rosacea, pop a bit of metronidazole gel, if that doesn't work, tetracycline, um, and then erythy, erythromycin is an alternative. Um, isotretinoin can be used, but less effective. Next slide, please. This brings us on to skin infections. Okay, I've tried to put a picture of everything. Some of it's a bit <laughs> revolting um, but you've got the bacterial erysipelas which is the slap cheek syndrome um, again superficial uh, skin infection um, and you've got the cellulitis again superficial and impetigo characterized by the yellow crusting so you treat the erysipelas and cellulitis um, when it's caused by strep, you treat it with amoxicillin. Um, in Patigo, it's flu clocks because it's usually staph aureus. Um, you've got some viral um, conditions there. So the one right in the middle, um, it looks like, I think it's supposed to be varicella zoster, 
um but it to me kind of looks more umbilicated doesn't it uh, like the bottom right of Molluscum contagiosum which is a pox virus <laughs> Um, so they, they can look quite similar, but obviously you'd be able to tell a varicella zoster by the fact that it's in a particular dermatome. Um, and then what that uh, bottom picture is also covering is a bit of HPV. Uh, it was a bit too revolting to show you the whole picture, but it's uh, that. And you've also got the warts in the hand. Um, and I've also included the herpes zoster, which is typically again following a dermatome and at the top there herpes simplex. Um, and I mean with molluscum contagiosum, it's common typically in school children, as the name suggests, it's very contagious and it is common in the immunosuppressed. It lasts approximately two months. Um, and there's no specific treatment, but it's just important to be aware that it's contagious to try and not infect those people. Um, with um, skin infections, important to swab. They've got um, MRSA. They'd benefit from some antiseptic washer, hibby scrub, dermal cream. Um, if it is um, infected, again, we've mentioned flu clocks. Um, for an impetigo and um, a mox for erysipelas, but for the pen allergic, erythromycin is a good substitute. Um, deeper skin infections um, can, uh, so if it's a, a worse cellulitis and they're systemically unwell, um, associated with diabetes, uh, can give IV flu clocks plus minus a benzyl penicillin um, and depending on the patient's mobility will either require admission for IV antibiotics or if they're ambulatory they can come back to ambulatory care so um, a lot of uh, hospitals have an ambulatory care pathway for uh, cellulitis and for example, they give um, they give them a shot of keftraxone, which has good coverage and um, bring them back the next day to come to ambulatory care for another shot. And if it's a once daily regimen, it's easier to treat um, and they can check blood tests when they do come in um, and convert to oral therapy when appropriate or if the patient is above a certain BMI, oral therapy is not just not going to do it. And so they just have the full therapy IV via um, ambulatory care. Next slide, please. Some more infections, <laughs> joyful. Um, so these are just the fungal infections. You've got the athlete's foot. Um, and essentially for all of these, um, antifungal cream plus minus a topical steroid. So use of terbinafen or clotrimazole um, is useful or trimavate is the steroid. Um, they usually require application over a long period of time, especially tinea pedis that I mean should be at least uh, six weeks um, and so sometimes um, the, the treatment fails because of non-compliance. Um, if they required, if they were very, if they were systemically unwell and they required uh, antifungal like fluconazole, that could be given, but LFTs need to be monitored and there are multiple uh, interactions with these medications so it's important to check interactions. Next slide please. So that's skin infections. Next slide please. So this 30 year old man presents to A&E with this generalized rash, it's itchy and painful recently commenced on antibiotics from mild chest infection. What is the most likely diagnosis? 
There's nothing in the chat so far. Oh, got erythema multiforme, mycoplasma. Yep. So, yes, uh, that is correct. And now, as well as A, B, C, D, E, sorry, A, B, C, D, and supportive care, what else should you do? So what has caused this? Ah, you've, you've put mycoplasma there. Yes, good shout. You also have yeah. Stephen Johnson's on there as well. So, yes. Um, so yeah, that is that is correct. Um, mycoplasma can be associated with erythema multiforme, but as a double edged sword, <clears throat> they're on antibiotics and the antibiotics can also cause erythema multiforme. So we ought to stop the antibiotics. Next slide, please. So let's just um, detail the fact that we need to stop antibiotics. Next slide. Drug reactions, so these are very common. They happen about 3% of inpatients and they can be of varying presentation. When they happen, uh, we always get dermatologists to come and have a look. They usually take pictures, um, get very excited and sometimes want a biopsy. Um, if it's following commencement of medication, obviously a drug history is important. Um, so that we can withdraw uh, the drug and see if the rash gets better. So I've just listed some concerning features. Obviously, wider coverage uh, is concerning. If there's any mucosal or facial involvement, uh, blistering, because that can be quite dehydrating, evidence of necrosis or infection, so if any of the lesions become infected. Um, lymphadenopathy arthralgia can be associated and obviously abnormalities in the bloods and shock. Next slide please. So erythema multiforme, uh, Stephen Johnson's and toxic epidermal necrolysis are all part of the same spectrum where erythema multiforme is the least severe and 10 is the most severe. Next slide, please. Um, I've just popped on the features um, and essentially there are minor and major features uh, that differentiate the different erythema multiformes. SJS and 10 are essentially when you have blisters and um, they become quite predominant. You can get mucous membrane involvement in erythema multiforme, uh, so that doesn't particularly differentiate there. Um, and then you've also got the epidermal detachment. Uh, usually this, this can is defined as less than 10% of the total body surface area in major erythema multiforme. Um, and then in SJS or 10, 10's associated with greater than 30%. Next slide, please. So that's the most severe form. And it also kind of looks like a staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. Um, and essentially this just illustrates the complications of such a skin condition. You've got lack of thermoregulation. This person's losing a lot of fluid. They can become quite hypertensive um, and lose a lot of heat. And just through this um, oliguria, electrolyte imbalances, um, they, because they're unwell, they'd have a reduced consciousness, um, may develop respiratory compromise. Uh, sometimes even just because they're in pain um, and finding it difficult to um, take sufficient breaths in and out. Um, they can have ocular problems if there is any eye involvement and that's quite serious. Um, and then they can obviously get scarring. Um, there can be GI involvement, including um, esophageal stricturing. 
which doesn't help matters, and obviously pain and arthralgia. Next slide, please. So this is the scoring system for toxic epidermal necrolysis called SCORE 10. Um, and it's validated uh, by BAD and the scores essentially predict mortality and just quantifies to you how bad this patient's uh, condition is. Um, I think in terms of the exams, for exam purposes, just learn the actual features on there. Um, that's just uh, useful to know, obviously, if they're tachycardic, uh, increasing age, um, a higher bicarb, uh, etc. Um, it's probably more difficult to learn mortalities and I mean they don't tend to ask that although sometimes they get, depending on how mean they're feeling they can. Um, obviously if anyone is this unwell they do need an urgent referral to dermatology but also to critical care um, and they'd need supportive care either in HDU or a burns unit. If their score 10 is more than three they should be in intensive care. Um, they need very specialised wound care and a multidisciplinary team looking after them. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview slide of the mechanism of drug reactions, which I quite like. So you've got the type one to four hypersensitivity reactions, type one being anaphylactic and being associated with angioedema, urticaria, and anaphylaxis, uh, which is the typical bee sting or, you know, peanut allergy uh, reaction. Type 2 is cytotoxic, so can um, just be a thrombocytopenia following uh, commencement of antibiotics, um, can also include uh, 10. Type 3, immune complex mediated, so this can be a serum sickness or a vasculitis. Type 4 cell mediated, this is associated with uh, 10 as well and also a morbilliform rash. So we'll go on to the morbilliform rash. Next slide please. So this is usually just a macular papula symmetrical rash with some fever uh, or malaise after about uh, five days of being exposed to a drug. Um, and this can get worse, so it's a stepping stone pre erythroderma and 10. Can happen due to any of the following medications. Um, and if that happens five to 10 days after commencement of any of those, just stop them and it should start to get better. Next slide, please. There's also acute generalised exanthematous pustulosis. Uh, and I hope you can see how that's essentially loads of pustules. This is very uncommon um, and happens very quickly, starting at face and flexures, and they can be quite uh, unwell systemically and have uh, a leukocytosis. And again, this is associated with the following medication, less so with penicillins, um, but can be associated with antifungals, tetracyclines and the like. Next slide, please. So DRESS. DRESS stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic sy symptoms. I love the name because it just describes it all in one. Um, I've actually had a patient that had quite overt dress. Um, this one's a bit more common. I've never seen Agep, the one the prior one. Um, the morbilliform rash happens quite frequently. Um, but this, so after starting an antibiotic, if you start noticing eosinophils increasing and then patient starts to become systemically unwell, have a look at the patient and have a look and see if there's any rash. Uh, so this could be macular papula, can include pustules and it can get worse with um, other uh, involvement, so other organ involvement such as hepatitis, 
pericarditis can affect kidneys. Um, and that there is an element of a genetic uh, predisposition to this one. So next slide, please. It's important to take an accurate history, stop any likely offending drug. There is a bit of cross reactivity, so it's important to avoid related medication. Um, again, this all you don't make all these decisions all happens following multiple discussions with dermatologists, microbiologists and whoever um, you know is around. Um, but just know the culprit drugs, so anti-epileptic sulfonamides, allopurinol. Um, sulfonamides aren't used quite as much, uh, but for example, in patients with bronchiectasis or cystic fibrosis, they do use septrin a lot, and so these reactions can happen. Uh, just because of the bugs they grow, they are still still sometimes using septrin. It's not one of those um, medications that we use day in, day out in a usual DGH hospital, um, but in specialised centres for these uh, things where they grow all sorts of bugs, um, they can get this. Um, for dress that they obviously need admitting um, and monitoring of the um, abnormalities, they can get electrolyte abnormalities, um, thrombocytopenia and the like. Uh, next slide please. It's important to, sorry I've skipped over to erythroderma, uh, go back one please. Um, so it's important to treat supportively with emollient soap substitution and a topical steroid. Uh, usually we just refer to the dermatologist and they prescribe a bunch of creams and we just give them to the patient um, and they would want a skin biopsy and depending on the severity either topical or systemic steroids. Next slide please. So erythroderma is essentially a very severe, um, this is what dress can become, agate can become, morbid form rash can progress to um, and then this affects the entire skin surface and can cause exfoliation ex um, and it can be quite itchy, uh, can uh, be associated with some hair loss as well and has multiple complications um, such as secondary infection and, and the other complications that you can get with all of these drug reactions really. Next slide please. These are the causes of erythroderma, as you can see, quite extensive. And again, there's a few malignancies there that can cause it and HIV. Next slide, please. Um, and management is much the same as most of the others. Um, you'll need emollients and soap substitution. It's very important to ensure that um, they are warmed up and they're not overly exposed um, and if they are overheating it's important to ensure that they are given fluids or they're drinking enough so an accurate fluid balance is important. Um, if they do need antibiotics for super added infection um, it's in, it will need further discussion as to what antibiotics um, just given that they've had a drug reaction and in, it's important to check for interactions. And again, the dermatologist would arrange a skin biopsy and consider whether or not they need uh, systemic versus topical steroids. Next slide, please. That's our overview and that's the last one, drug reactions. So that's all of them. Now I've got a few more slides that we don't need to go over really but I've included them um, just so that you've got them. They're just important topics. Um, and yeah, any questions? Um, if you do want to just carry on, there are only a few more slides. Let me know. If not, that's fine. I know there, there are a lot, a lot of slides. Yep, we got happy to carry on, so...
Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So next slide, please. Just a few um, that just can come up. Um, so this one is four year old child presents with this unusual blistering rash. Uh, what condition would you be most concerned about? I got right, where you're going. Hand. Yeah. So um, someone's put the hand, foot, and mouth. Uh, so this is they haven't given us the hand, but like where you're going. Um, someone's put non-accidental injury, and yes, um, that is correct. Next slide. Um, so it, essentially, for finals, they want to make sure that you're a safe doctor. And part of safety is just always thinking of safeguarding and when it comes to children, non-accidental injury. So just always have that at the back of your mind when it comes to children and if it's unusual. Um, because obviously with this question, they haven't really given you uh, much more of a distribution. Um, so, so always think about what information they have given you. They have thought about the information they're giving you. Um, and then particularly if, for example, it's a child who is not walking, is less than the age of one, you always have to think about uh, non-accidental injury. Brilliant. Next slide, please. So this always comes up. So um, I've got condition A and then there's the kind of cross section diagram of what the pathology is. And then condition B, and again, there's a cross-sectional diagram of where the blister is. If you can see that there's the epidermis and then lower than that, the dermis. So A tends to be more superficial involving the epidermis, whereas B is in between the dermis and epidermis. Throw out some names, pop them on the chat. Yep, someone's put bullus pemphigoid. Yep. Which one is pemphigoid? I think Joe's put B is pemphigoid. What's A? No, next slide. Yes, well timed there. Just as someone put pemphigus vulgaris, yeah. So you've got pemphigus on the left there and bullus pemphigoid on the right. Next slide, please. So autoimmune conditions associated with inflammatory skin conditions can be associated with drugs as well. UV therapy, radiation and malignancy. Always important to look for malignancy in these as well. Next slide, please. So pemphigus occurs in the middle age. You get the flaccid blisters and there can be mucosal involvement, can be painful. This isn't itchy and nails can be affected. Next slide, please. Pemphigoid uh, tends to affect the older population over 65 equal sex distribution and can be preceded by a pruritic erythematous rash. So unlike pemphigus, this one's itchy. Next slide, please. So this is just to compare pemphigus versus pemphigoid. Um, I always remember us and oid. Us as in it can affect us, um, people in 30s, younger. Oid as in old affects older people. And then from the letters, the tense blisters like an O. So if it's pemphigoid, um, it tends to be a pemphigoid if it's proper blisters. Flaccid, sheared, has an S, is pemphigus. I hope that illustrates it and cements it into your minds there. Uh, 
OK, next slide, please. Treatment. We do pierce the blisters uh, with a sterile needle, but it's very important not to de-roof because that is a natural barrier. Um, and just apply topical steroids and antibacterial emollients. And it's important to refer to the dermatologist who will then uh, organise skin biopsy and systemic steroids. So they do need oral prednisolone there. OK, almost there. Last question, I think. Next slide. <coughs> so 75 year old gentleman, what's he got? Any ideas? You can pop a question mark if you don't know. Um, very itchy, scaly, lives in a nursing home. Yes, someone's put scabies, correct. OK, next slide. So. It is scabies, you need to treat the patient. This is very contagious. And so nursing home contacts also need to be treated. And um, HPA, the Health Protection Authority, also need to be um, informed because these can cause epidemics. Um, so scabies are a microscopic mite. Next slide, please. Um, Sarcopter scabii and um, there's a worldwide um, distribution of where you can be affected anywhere, essentially it's about 300 million cases a year and transmission is by direct contact. Um, there's a particular form of scabies called Norwegian's crusted scabies that you don't need very much contact for. It's particularly um, transmissible. And you can see that actually at the bottom. That's the uh, Norwegian crusted scabies and that's the appearance and that's what the uh, old gentleman had. Treatment is with permethrin cream all over or a malathion cream. Um, and they'd need one treatment um, and then the next week, second treatment, uh, neck down for the adults in elderly and children just because they scratch and touch everywhere. Also, it needs for the scalp and face, which need different, um, uh, different um, ointments, um, especially for scalp and face. Um, all the bedding, clothing need to be washed. It's a bit of a... Uh, an annoyance really and all household contacts also need to be um, treated because once you scratch somewhere and then somewhere else it just spread and that is the final slide I think um, always um, scabies almost always comes up and um, just have a think when when you get a um, a question. If they mention that they're in a nursing home, it's that, you know, uh, cohabited place where these things can can spread is what they're kind of going for there. Um, anyway, any questions for me? Next slide. Um, and please do fill in a feedback form. Uh, if you found anything worked or anything didn't work or any suggestions for improvement. But any questions? <laughs>